Welcome to Food for Thought Podcast, the place to explore, celebrate, and manifest a life motivated and defined by unconditional compassion and optimal wellness. Today's episode is A Kindness of Ravens, words and expressions from our black feathered friends. Before we begin, my name is Colleen patrick Adro. Hello, you can find me at joyfulvegan.com. You can find me on social media and most recently on Clubhouse, where we're having conversations and connections every single day. You can find my books wherever books are sold, and you can join me in my online cooking classes or on any of my vegan trips around the world. We go to Europe, we go to Africa, we go to Asia, just saying, go check out cpgtrips.com for that. Food for Thought podcast is in its 15th year. Because of supporters like you, I know that you've probably noticed there aren't sponsors on this podcast. I don't have sponsored posts on my social media accounts. I just try to create value for you. And in return, listeners like you support this podcast and my work in general by going to patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau and becoming a supporter. If you are a supporter at $5 a month, $10 a month, we have supporters at $30 a month, $100 a month. It's really up to you. There are perks depending on the level you choose. Even though I know that most supporters are doing it because they want this work to continue. So if you are one of those people, go to patreon.com today. The support has declined immensely. I want to keep doing this work and I don't want to have to go out and spend my time getting sponsors and dealing with all of that. I really just want to create value for you. That's what being a patron is. It's value for value. So thank you so much for your support. Thank you for subscribing to Food for Thought. Thanks for listening. Thanks for sharing and for leaving ratings and reviews. In fact, very recently, there was a review. You can go to uh, podcasts, what used to be called iTunes, and you can go see the most recent review was from someone who said, I love this podcast so much that I'm now a Patreon supporter. So that's just a little, (laughs) little incentive. And thank you so much to that person and to everybody who's listening. I want to also make sure you know that we are very mindful and take this pandemic very seriously. But our Tuscany trip in October of 2021 is starting to fill up, which feels really good. I, I, like many of you, cannot wait to get out and start feeling a little more open and flexible, uh, especially with uh, the vaccine rollout. And there's some hope that we can travel safely and 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 not infect one another uh, or become infected ourselves. So we take it very seriously, but we are excited that Tuscany is starting to fill up. We have our Dardogne, France in September 2021. We'll see if that's a go. And Tuscany is still a question mark. If the trip doesn't run in that it doesn't fill up or it's not safe to run, uh, you get your money back 100%. So if you are interested in going to Tuscany with us, go, you know, reserve your spot right now. And if we if the trip doesn't go, you get your money back. However, if it's safe enough, and if it sells, you're coming to Tuscany with me for an incredible, incredible trip. We're going to be going to farmers markets, we're going to be going to wineries, I'm going to be doing a couple cooking demonstrations, we have our own villa, and the max number of people is only 14. So it's a small group and it's going to be really, really special. So go to CPG, that's for Colleen Patrick Goudreau, cpgtrips.com and reserve your spot today. I am really excited about this particular episode. You know I love my animology episodes, and this is one I've been excited about writing for a long time because I love corvids, uh, the birds like jays and crows and ravens. If you've been listening, you know I recently did an episode on Jim Crow and what the animal has to do with that expression. And if you have never listened and you don't know what an animology is, it's a term I coined to refer to the animal-related words and expressions we use every day and how they affect and reflect our regard for, our thoughts about, our treatment of other animals, including human animals. You can listen to my TEDx animology talk for more about that. We have thousands of animologies in our English language and 
Many, in fact, have to do with crows and ravens and jays, this species of birds in the corvid family. I know I'm not supposed to pick favorites, but the corvid family is my favorite family of birds. <laughs> so, And many of you did appreciate that recent Jim Crow episode because you had no idea, hadn't really thought about the origins of the term Jim Crow, and really didn't even make the connection that there was an animal, a bird, a crow in that expression. Because we say it so often, we really forget. As I mentioned in that episode, I will be writing more episodes on Corvid-related animologies. There are a lot. We've got expressions. Uh, we've got crow's feet, uh, right, as in the wrinkles around our eyes. We've got the expression as the crow flies. Uh, we have stone the crows as an expression of shock or surprise. I don't think a lot of people use that today. Uh, to crow about something means to brag about something. To rook means to swindle or to cheat. And we have expressions like jaywalk, um, which everybody knows, to cross the street without regard for approaching traffic. So we're going to do other uh, episodes on Corvid-related expressions and words, but today we're going to focus specifically on raven animologies. So sit back, pour yourself a cuppa, and let's talk about all the raven-related words and expressions. As I'm recording this, I can hear a jay off in the distance, a scrub jay. We don't have blue jays here, we have scrub jays, and Stellar's jays, and I can hear... I don't think you can, but I can hear them off in the distance. Now, we do have lots of jays, and we do have a lot of crows. We see crows every day. It's really lovely. We have lots of fountains in our uh, around our property, and I love seeing all the birds come to the fountain. We have birds as small as hummingbirds come and drink from the little bubble, and we have birds as large as crows come and do the same thing. So it's pretty fun to see these massive birds sitting on top of these these fountains and drinking from the from the from the fountain. Uh, so I love seeing crows all around. There are uh, differences between ravens and crows. I, I always forget, but in short, ravens are larger. They're almost twice the size of crows. Uh, they're almost as large as red-tailed hawks. Crows are about the size of pigeons. And also, um, crows tend uh, to be comfortable in populated areas, urban areas, which is where we are. Uh, ravens don't like that so much. So if you see a really big crow in the city, it's probably a really big crow and not a raven. Um, we don't really see ravens in our yards, but apparently ravens are populating more in the San Francisco Bay Area. You will never see ro crows and ravens together because they do not like each other. So you will never, ever see them together. Uh, but this family of corvids, they are huge contributors. Uh, they are scavengers. They're part of part of the cleanup crew, uh, so to speak, of the bird world. They eat carrion and garbage. And, you know, they're just they're just the most intelligent of the birds. They're just incredible, uh, like all members of the Corvid family. So love them. And they're just beautiful. I just absolutely love them. So let's start with the word raven itself and what the etymology is. So raven is an old English word. Um, I'm going to spell it for you because in Old English, there would have been an H and that H would have been pronounced then, but today we would just, uh, it would be silent, but H-R-A-E-F-N. Now that A-E is that Old English um, runic symbol that, that, you know, looks like an A and an E smushed together, um, that today would be pronounced A, eh, but then it would have been um, more of an A ah sound. So this would have been basically Hrafen, um, and that was inherited from German, that word, that Old English word. Now, stay with me here. The Proto-Indo-European root, Kerr, if that would have been pronounced that way, remember Proto-Indo-European is a language that was put together by linguists based on the evolution of current words. So we don't know how it was pronounced back then because we don't have any speakers of proto of Indo-European. Um, but K-E-R uh, was a Proto-Indo-European root, let's say it's pronounced ker, uh, meaning cry out, which is most likely a reference to the harsh sound of the bird's call. And you can imagine that if you think of how crows and ravens and jays sound, it's that very harsh sound. And so you can hear it in ker, caw, caw, right? That caw sound that we associate with these corvids. And so from that Proto-Indo-European root ker, we have the Latin word corvus. So you can hear how that happened. So Corvus and Corvidae, Corvids, um, 
the species and the family of birds, uh, you know, uh, corvine, which is the adjective related to birds in the corvid family. Corvus is Latin for raven. And that Latin word corvus is derived from that Proto-Indo-European root cur. And you can hear it. You can hear it in the, in the word itself. And that's one of the things I love about etymology in general, and animology in particular, is that many names for animals, especially those that came from Proto-Indo-European, reflect various characteristics of the animals themselves. In this case, the way the birds sound. And that goes for all corvids. Listen to the episode I did on Old English words for pig and cow and steer and bull and chicken uh, versus the French words. Uh, I talked about how in the Old English words, which were all from Proto-Indo-European, all of those words were, are words that derived from different characteristics of the animal. So I think it's absolutely fascinating. So in this case, we have the word corvid from the Proto-Indo-European root cur, meaning harsh call or, or loud call. Now, another bird with the same root uh, uh, is the cormorant. Uh, um, it comes into English through Old French. Originally from late Latin, um, the name of that bird was Corvus marinus, and now that's been smashed together, and we have cormorant. So you can hear in Corvus marinus, Corvus meaning raven, and marinus meaning sea. So Corvus marinus is a sea raven, and indeed cormorants are seabirds. So the, corm the cormorant is known for its loud voice. And so again, we've got that Proto-Indo-European root cur, meaning to cry out in that word cormorant. But cormorant is basically an animology because it means sea raven. There's also a bird I hadn't heard of before researching this episode or a bird I'm not familiar with, and that's called the night jar. You've probably heard of this bird. It's a nocturnal bird found all around the world. Its common English name is a compound word, as you can hear, night plus jar. And it's so called for the jarring sounds made by the male when the female is brooding. So again, the name of the bird reflects a characteristic of the bird, which is the jarring sounds it makes. So night jar refers to that vocalization. And the old English word for this bird, or an old English word for this bird, was night raven, nicht raffin. So night raven uh, is what this bird would have been called in old English. Today we just say night jar. So I thought that was kind of cool. I love animals named after animals, these kind of double animologies, if you will. We also have uh, animological words that reflect another characteristic of these birds, and that's the shape of the raven's beak. Now, if you listen to the episode on anatomy parts uh, named after animals, you'll remember I mentioned coracoid, uh, which is a bone that extends from our scapula. Uh, to uh, our sternum, and it comes from the Greek word korone, K-O-R-O-N-E, uh, kor koron meaning uh, crow, uh, plus uh, the word that means shape or form. So the coracoid was named by Galen in the second century AD for its resemblance to the beak of a crow or raven. Right. So again, uh, coracoid, apparently it's a process and not a bone. I'm not an expert in anatomy, but uh, but if you just type in coracoid into Google, into a search engine, you'll see that it's a bone that has this triangular shape that looks like the beak of a crow or a raven. And it's not only body parts uh, or other birds named after the resemblance uh, to these birds, um, to ravens. We also have inanimate objects like the corbel. So a corbel is a piece of stone or wood or brick or other building material that projects from the face of a wall. And you might want to look this up so you can see exactly what it looks like. And it's used to support a cornice or an arch. And it's an architectural uh, um, feature of a wall. And so it basically the profile of that looks like a raven's beak. And that comes from, again... Uh, corbel uh, comes from uh, it would have it, it came into English through Old French, so corbel uh, is Old French, uh, but that came from Latin corvus, meaning raven, so called because of its beaked shape. So look that up, and you'll see that beaked shape. Um, we have another inanimate object named after raven's beak. It's a bit more obsol obscure, and it's obsolete now. 
But there was such a thing as the Raven's Bill, which is a term used to describe various weapons and tools having a head resembling the bill of a raven. So in modern French, we would say a bec de corbeau is what is what one of these weapons would have been called. Uh, in old French, it would have been bec de corbeau. So same root, uh, bec de corbeau is a type of pole arm and war hammer that was popular in medieval Europe. If you just looked up uh, Bechter Cor Corbeau or Corban, uh, you'll see that it you'll see that it looks like the beak of a raven. Um, so raven's beak, raven's beak is is how it got its name because of the raven's beak. Now there's also another word. It's more of a an etymology for birds' beaks in general, like a bird, like a general bird's beak. But I'm just going to put it in here as well, because we're talking about words named after the shape of a raven's beak. This particular word, which is a word we use today, uh, is called such because of the shape of, because of its shape resembling that of a bird. Raven is a bird, so let's include this, even though I will do an episode just specifically on words, uh, etymologies from birds in general. And that is the word rostrum. So a rostrum is the name for a platform or a stand that speakers stand on uh, to make a public speech, right? And so this word rostrum um, was called such because in, in the forum in ancient Rome, that, that platform that speakers would stand on was decorated with the beak heads of captured warships, the beak heads of, of warships. And, and so that's where the word rostrum comes from. And we still use that today to, to refer to that platform that people stand on to give speeches. So related in the sense that it's named after uh, beaks of birds, but I'm including it even though it's not specifically ravens, but I think you'll give me some leeway there. <laughs> so we also have the word corvus, as I said, is Latin for raven, but we have that as the name of a constellation. So that needs to be said because now we use that Latin word corvus in English basically to refer to a constellation uh, in the Southern Celestial Hemisphere. So Corvus is a constellation. Now, I plan on doing an entire episode on sports teams named after animals. We have the Eagles, the Falcons, the Cardinals, the Seahawks. And in the case of Corvids, we have the Toronto Blue Jays, which is a Canadian professional baseball team. And in the case of Ravens, we have the NFL football team, the Baltimore Ravens. But you may be surprised to know there are a ton of sports teams named after so many different animals. So we'll do a different episode on that. But I wanted to make sure you know about the Baltimore Ravens. Okay, so moving on from body parts and inanimate objects and sports teams and other animals named after ravens, let's turn our attention to all the names, first names and surnames whose origins mean Raven. Let's start with Raven itself. Raven itself is a first name and a last name. As a first name, it was recorded back in 1086 in the Doomsday Book in many areas of England. So Raven as a first name, um, it, it would have been coming through Scandinavian, obviously. Uh, um, and it would have been Hrafen. And it would have uh, been a very popular name. So 1086. And as a last name, it was also an as a masculine name and a last name. So it's been a feminine name, a masculine name, and a last name as early as the 12th century. So 11th century, late 11th century as a female first name, and then continued as a name for a surname and a masculine name in the 12th century. It's a long time ago. <laughs> it goes back a very long time ago. Now, we also have the last name Crow, that's just also a name, or Craw, and then we also have Crawford, which you would have heard of as a last name, but also as a place name, and that comes from the English word Craw, meaning crow, and Ford, meaning pass or crossing, and you would remember that if you listen to the episode we did on geographical place names named after animals, Oxford, for instance, is the place where the oxen crossed. So Crawford means the place where the crows cross, right? So that's what that means. Um, and then aside from the obvious, like raven and crow as raven-related names, there are many names that mean raven or crow 
some with Scandinavian origins, some with Welsh origins, some with German origins, and some with Latin origins. And the first one I'm going to name will be familiar to you if you were a Game of Thrones fan, and that is the name Bran. So Bran Stark was a pivotal character in the books and in the TV series, and he was very closely associated with crows and ravens, right? Bran means raven. It's of Welsh origin, uh, and in Welsh mythology, Bran the Blessed was the son of uh, the god Lear, who was also called the Raven God. Now, Bran Stark was called Bran, that was his nickname, but his full name was Brandon. Uh, and so Brandon in Welsh means uh, crow or raven, but in Anglo-Saxon, Brandon actually means hill covered with broom. And when I say broom, I don't mean like things you sweep with. I mean, there is a plant called broom and it's actually now quite invasive. It's, it was taken, it was, it was brought over to the United States from England, from the UK. And, uh, and it is now an invasive, I, ha I hate to say it, but it is a weed and we have it all around us and we pull it up because it just it would just take over. It would just take over the entire <laughs> world. Uh, so um, it's very pretty. It's very pretty. It has really pretty yellow flowers, but that's what it means to be a hill covered with broom. That's what Brandon means in Anglo-Saxon. But Bran and Brandon in Welsh means raven, as does Brannon, B-R-A-N-N-O-N. Branwen is the female version of Bran. So we do have a female uh, name meaning raven here. Again, I'm mostly naming uh, male uh, masculine names here, but that's just the way it is. We have fewer uh, feminine names uh, meaning raven. Even though I think of when I think of raven as a first name, I actually think of a female. We also have Bram, as in Bram Stoker, the author of Dracula, and Bram means raven with Celtic roots, also with Celtic roots, and Bramwell, uh, which would literally mean raven well. We have other names which might be less familiar to some of you, especially in the United States. Some of these names I, I, I feel are more familiar um, or more associated with uh, English uh, names, but Bartram means bright raven or glorious raven. That's actually with Scandinavian origins. Beltran means bright raven with Spanish origins. And Bertram and Bertrand, as in Bertrand Russell, means bright raven with Germanic origins. Brainerd is another one, it would be a common surname rather than a first name. I don't know if I would want my name to be Brain. Brainerd, <laughs> but it's a last name, uh, it means courageous raven. And if your creative mind is in full speed, as my husband's was when I was sharing this with him, he asked if the name Bernard also had origins in raven because, you know, Bertrand and Bertram, okay, so what about Bernard or Bernard, depending on how you pronounce it? I was able to say to him very confidently, no, it does not have a uh, raven in its origins, but it is an animology. If you listened to the episode about words and expressions from the word bear, you would remember that Bernard and Bernie, as well as Barney and Bernadette and Bernadine, are names whose origins mean bear. Uh, so listen to that episode if you want more bear-related words, but Bernard uh, means uh, has origins in bear, not raven. Other uh, names from bear, Ursula. Uh, Bjorn, Beowulf, and the word berserk is also from the word bear. So you have to listen to that etymology episode. Now back to our birds. In addition to first and last names from the words raven and crow, we also have first and surnames whose origins are from Latin corvus, right? Meaning raven or crow. And those are names like Corbin. Corbin is both a first name and a last name with English origins. The actor Corbin Burnson, if you remember him from the, I think, guess the 90s, uh, there was the show L.A. Law. So Corbin uh, Burnson was the actor on that show. Corbin meaning crow or raven. We have the British uh, MP, Jeremy Corbin, uh, whose name uh, means raven. Um, uh, Corbin is also a reference to a person with black hair because ravens and crows have black feathers. So if you have a baby and they have black hair, dark hair, you, um, Corbin would be a really lovely name to reflect their dark hair. Uh, Corbin as a first name was 
recorded as early as 1086, again, in the Doomsday Book in Warwickshire and Kent in that area. And the surname Corbin was recorded um, also in the late 11th century. So I think that's pretty amazing. It goes back really far. Corbett, uh, C-O-R-B-E-T-T, -T, is another name with ravens hidden within, uh, with French origins. Cormac uh, is of Irish origins, also meaning raven. And Corvin, similar to Corbin, but with a V, uh, all mean raven. And another name that has two animals hidden within is Wolfram, with German origins, meaning wolf, combined with Robin, meaning raven. So you've got Wolfram, meaning wolf, but it has wolf and raven, wolf, wolf and raven. I don't know many Wolframs, but there is a, a, a contemporary polymath named Stephen Wolfram. So you may be familiar with him. And then finally, we have one last name meaning raven, and that's Ingram. Scandinavian origin, it means raven of peace or raven of Anglia. Um, Ingram actually means, very specifically, it means English raven. Um, and it's very interesting. So you have to just kind of picture the word Ingram, I-N-G-R-A-M. And it is a combination of the word um, I-N from the word Anglia, meaning which is the um, the Angles, uh, the people of Anglanda from northern Germany who invaded eastern and northern Britain in the fifth century. That's where we get the name England from. So uh, the I-N in Ingram actually means uh, English. And then the suffix uh, is from the word that means raven. So Ingram literally means English raven. And I said that most of these are boys' names that I that I named. Um, Ingram, I think, could be either. I, it's more of a German name. My association with Ingram is actually as a name for a book distributor. I used to work in uh, in a bookstore, and every box in the back was uh, from Ingram. And then today, I mean today, I mean, as an author, of course, I know who the distributors are. Ingram is a very well known book distributor, so that's my association with Ingram. And then uh, we, we do have a, another feminine name aside from Branwen, and that is I hope you, I'm sorry you can hear my neighbor's dog, um, and that's the name Ravenna. Um, which um, means raven, and I think that's such a pretty name. Ravenna as a girl's name, um, uh, I don't know how popular it is, but uh, it is a name possibly named after the uh, Italian city of Ravenna. It's possible that that's where it gets its name uh, or where, where that feminine name for, uh, you know, for a girl comes from. Uh, and, the, and the city of Ravenna may or may not be the feminine version of Ra Ravenna. Raven. It may be, it may not be. It's actually possible that the word Ravenna to refer to this, um, this, it was the capital city in the Western Roman Empire. It was a very important city. Um, and it's known for its late uh, Roman and Byzantine architecture. It's likely that it derived from the Etruscan word Racena. That's what the Etruscans called themselves. And so that's possibly where it's from. But it could also be the feminine name uh, for Raven. And I'm going to go with that. <laughs> so, um, but still Ravenna as a, as a female name is very possibly also the feminine uh, name for Raven. And then we have a couple place names. If you're familiar with uh, the town of Ramsgate in um, southeast England in Kent, um, I know it sounds like it would be the gate of the ram, but actually the earliest references indicate that it's actually the gate of the raven, the raven's gate. It was originally Ramesgate, um, but back in Anglo-Saxon, um, in Anglo-Saxon, it was actually in, uh, recorded in 1225. It was Hrafen's Gate, meaning Raven's Gate. And then it just changed over time to become Ramesgate and then Ramsgate. And th that's what it is now. So you look at it and it looks like it's the gate of a ram. So that would be an etymology, but it's actually an etymology named after ravens. So one um, word I want to just address before we close is a word that a number of people were asking me about when they knew I was working on this episode, and that's the word ravenous. Uh, is the word ravenous, people would ask me, related to ravens? And the answer is yes and no. It's related to ravens in the sense that the adjective can be used to describe them, but that adjective can be used to describe us as well. So really the answer is no. Um, ravenous is not an animology in the sense that the origins of the word ravenous, even though it has the word raven in there, is not doesn't have anything to do with the bird. Uh, it's actually uh, the root uh, is a, the Latin root really um, 
uh, means uh, to take by force, and it's the same uh, origins as the, uh, has the same origins as the words rape and rapacious, uh, but it's not raven. It's actually robinair. Um, is is the root, and that means uh, the forcible seizure of another's property, plunder, um, but it doesn't mean raven. So sorry about that. <laughs> and then we have expressions. We don't have a lot of expressions specifically from ravens. We have black as a raven's wing, black as a raven's feather, referring to the dark feathers of, of these birds. To be raven haired is to have glossy black hair, uh, usually said of a female. Um, and then, of course, we have some collective the collective nouns of ravens. I did a whole episode on collective nouns, which are super fun. If you haven't listened to that episode, you know, so many people have heard of the murder of crows and why it's called the murder of crows. Um, it's based on this f- persistent but fallacious folktale that, that crows form tribunals to judge and punish the bad behavior of a member of the flock. Um, so um, if the verdict goes against the defendant... Uh, so the story goes that bird is killed or murdered by the flock. The basis, in fact, is probably that occasionally crows will kill a dying crow who doesn't belong to their territory. But most commonly, I'm sure that that word or that expression really comes from the fact that both crows and ravens are associated with death. They're associated with battlefields and, and medieval hospitals and execution sites and cemeteries because they scavenged or they scavenge on human remains. So I think that's probably where that expression comes from. And related to that, a word we did not cover is the word ravenstone. A tombstone in England is sometimes called a ravenstone, and that's because of its association with cemeteries. But to um, talk about the collective noun for ravens and not crows, so murder of crows, which I don't like because I think that does perpetuate just this myth that, you know, that crows are nasty and, and evil and they're associated with darkness and and violence. Um, but aside from murder of crows, we have the unkindness of ravens. Uh, one of the things I talked about in that episode, the collective nouns for animals, uh, is that there was a book in 1486 called the Book of St. Albans. And that book is where you have this original collection of a lot of these uh, collective nouns. And some of them are super fun. They're not all animal related. Um, they're based on characteristics. Some of them are um, humorous. You've got the, um, there's a there's a description of the um, the uh, the abominable sight of monks. <laughs> you have um, some really fun collections, not just like I said for animals, but that in that book of Saint Albans, you don't have the murder of crows. This was, again, this was 1486, but you do have the unkindness of ravens, and I think that's also um, based on this old folklore that adult ravens would push their babies out of the nest before they fly. So let's just do away with that. They don't do that. <laughs> they wouldn't. They wouldn't actually proliferate as much as they do if they were doing unkind things to their babies. So we can call them a flock. We can call them a kindness of ravens, which is why I called this episode that. I've also heard the word rave to refer to ravens, a rave of ravens. So I really like that. So there we have it. Uh, we just named uh, ravens, uh, uh, raven, raven, uh, stone, um, for the, uh, for the, instead of tombstone, cormorant, night jar or night raven, coracoid, corbel, ravensbill, bec de corbin, uh, rostrum, corvus, as in the constellation, raven and crow as first and last names that go back a long way, Crawford, Bran, Brandon, Branwyn, Bram, Bramwell, Bartram, Beltran, Bertrand, Brainerd, Corbin, Corbett, Cormac, uh, Wolfram, Ingram, oops, Ingram, uh, Ravenna, Ramsgate, and the expressions black as a raven's wing, black as a raven's feather, and a rave of ravens, all inspired, all originating from the word raven, a word that describes this fabulous bird I hope you get to see and hear outside of semantics just in your everyday life for the ravens for the animals this is Colleen Patrick Gaudreau thank you so much for listening and thanks for supporting Food for Thought 